it away. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Ooh, feedback. Okay. Uh, let me disrobe uh, so y'all can hear me a little bit better. Um, do want to mention to you, I know some people are still gone on vacation. I know the Lees are gone to Grand Camp at Camp Caraway, so say a prayer for all those at Camp Caraway. Uh, you know, I'd never heard of Grand Camp, Grand Camp before I met, uh, before I came here, and it's the neatest idea where you take your grandkids to camp. My kids went last year, and it was the, it was the best thing in the world because my wife and I, we got time by ourselves. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. It was amazing. <laughs> But uh, we, uh, we just got back from the Charlottesville, Virginia area yesterday. Uh, we came back, uh, it's about Greensboro, we started seeing that haze from the Sahara Desert storm, whatever it is, and like, what in the world's happening? Because it was clear and beautiful up in Charlottesville. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But it's good to be back in civilization, back with my family, my church family. Those on cyberspace, on the, the cameras there, and all y'all in person here, I uh, do have a few quick announcements for you. I want to mention to you that we are, uh, 4th of July is Saturday. You all notice some of the decorations here back in Huggins Hall as well. Audrey has done an excellent job. We'll have a 4th of July themed service next Sunday uh, for that. Also mention to you that um, we are encouraging masks. So if you are in the, in the building, you know, keep your distance six feet away. And if you're able to have a mask, have a mask. Um, things are getting a little worse with the viruses. In fact, one of Mama's first cousins was hospitalized this past week because of the virus. Uh, and I saw on Facebook that uh, that cousin and her husband both have tested positive. He's, he's doing okay. They're still weak. Um, but uh, be in prayer for them. And i got some really good news for you. Uh, you know, we had Alva Jean's granddaughter on the prayer list, Autumn Parker. She's still on there. Well, she gave birth uh, on Monday... Uh, Alva Jean is a uh, great, a new great granddaughter, Marin Austin Parker. Now check out this weight: ten pounds one ounce. <laughs> Goodness gracious! <laughs> but uh, praise be to God that the fact that uh, the baby's doing well, mother's doing well, and uh, and everybody's healthy and good. But uh, lift them up in your, your prayers and praise to God. Um, mentioned to you also, uh, did get a phone call this morning. Most of y'all know Burnell uh, Branton. Uh, he got tested on Thursday for the COVID-19 virus. He hasn't got the results back yet. I'll try to let people know. I know some of y'all have been around Burnell. Some of you went with us Tuesday to Shelby. I'll let you know the result, results. If, you, if he does test positive, you may want to get tested, okay? It's, a, it's a, nothing really to laugh about. There's some people get really sick or some people that are barely getting sick. But there are some who are getting really, really sick. So, uh, but it's good to be back in the Lord's house today. Um, it's good to be back to worship with you. Oh, by the way, you know, I've been cleaning the sanctuary. Me and the boys have been cleaning the sanctuary. If anybody's missing a little journaling notebook, spiral-bound notebook, and missing reading glasses, I keep finding reading glasses. I don't know how you people are reading without your glasses. Uh, but I keep finding these in the sanctuary, so I encourage you all to get those, pick those up. Um, but a lot of things going on in our world, a lot of craziness going on in our world. Uh, a lot of, uh, just uh, turn on the news, there's something new and crazy every day. But you know, despite all this craziness, God's in control. Uh, despite the virus, God's in control. Despite our ailments and our illnesses, God is in control. May this hour we shut out the world and its cares, and may we focus this hour on God. At this time, we're going to sing a song to God be the glory. Can we please rise for number four, to God be the glory, and we'll only do one verse. Praise the Lord. 
Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things. Thank you. you. may be seated. At this time, we've got a video called 316. For God so loved the world, all of us, you and me. He loved us so much, he sent his only son, Jesus. The firstborn of creation, sent to take our place, to bear our burden, to suffer our consequence. We were far from God, but God didn't want to be far from us. Jesus came to bring us home. As a prodigal returns to their father, so too could we return to our Creator. A simple plan with just one requirement. Belief. For whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have life. Life eternal. At the very heart of God is love. Indescribable unrelenting, unstoppable love. That love shines a light, guiding us home. For God so loved the world. So uh, thanks for dealing with me, Brad. I apparently skipped over the prayer, I tell you. That's what I get for being on vacation. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I'm getting too old to sleep on an air mattress in a tent, I think. Um, in fact, it's so funny. Uh, our last night was uh, night four last uh, Friday night. And I, about the middle of the night, I'm like, my air mattress has deflated. Well, come to find out, apparently my foot had uh, got down to the end of the air mattress and unplugged or unhooked the air mattress. It was... So the, the valve was open, so air was seeping out of it. So, Luckily, God has given me some cushioning to keep myself safe. But I do mention prayer concerns to you. Uh, Ted Harris is on our prayer list, and he's been highlighted. Uh, that's uh, Ken's father. He's had issues with cellulitis. I talked to Audrey Tuesday, I believe, and he was in the hospital. Um, bad infection, cellulitis. Uh, don't know what, if he's gotten out yet or not, but be in prayer for Ted and Ken and the family. Uh, continue to pray for Mark and Tammy Hovis, who uh, have tested positive for COVID-19. Continue to pray for Autumn and the, and the new baby and the family. Uh, pray for Scott Powell. I talked to Tony this morning, and uh, Scott was working out of the house by the end of the week this week. Uh, they thought he'd had a stroke when he went to Baptist. Uh, come to find out that was a prior stroke he'd had. They don't know exactly why his, everything kind of bought him out on him when he was up in the mountains last weekend. But do be in prayer for Scott and Wendy. Uh, Tony did say that uh, they're doing better. Jean is at home. Jean came home on Friday, uh, and uh, she's happy to be at home, of course, and Tony's happy for her to be at home as well, but there's somebody staying there with them to take care of them. Uh, Tony is off the oxygen, had been on oxygen. Uh, he was doing an insulin shot twice a day. He's only doing it uh, in the evenings and as needed during the day, so that's a good thing, and he's able to lift a little bit and able to sleep on his side, so he's progressing well. Uh, with his surgery. Uh, also mentioned to you, uh, Boyce Whitworth, my uncle is on the prayer list. He was in the hospital for over three weeks, got out, went to the Bryan Center in Lincoln. They only kept him a few days because of insurance. He came home uh, Friday. Well, I got back to Mama's yesterday, because Mama lives right beside my uncle's. Got back to Mama's yesterday to pick up the dog, and I saw my uncle's driveway, uh, an ambulance. Apparently his hot, it's his hot. His heart stopped, apparently, 
In fact, it said, uh, Mama told me this morning that his heart stopped twice on the way to the hospital. So he's down in Gastonia. Uh, they may have to do a pacemaker. So he can't win for losing. So be in prayer for my uncle. He's, he's relatively young. He's only 67 years old. So be in prayer for him. Um, any other prayer concerns that we need to voice today? Pray for all those on vacation. I think the bakers are coming back today, I believe, last I heard. Uh, the leaves are at Grand Camp. Several others are on vacation. We just got back and it's safe journeys for the most part. Uh, but it's good to get away. It's good to uh, be away. But, you know, this day and age with the viruses and changing the rules and everything else, it's, it's adventurous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very, very much for your mercy and your grace. Unmerited grace. You love us even when we are rebellious. Even when we don't deserve your love. And we're about hateful to you, Lord. You still love us. We lift up this lost world. We lift up this world that is embroiled in arguing and bickering. A world that is filled with uh, disease. A world that is uh, falling apart at the seams with disasters. Lord, we know we need you. And we lift up all the individual names we've mentioned today as well as the other names that need prayer. May you work in the lives of those who need it most, Lord. And may you guide us and show us what we need to do to be your hands and your feet in this community, sharing the gospel, sharing compassion and love and mercy to those that need a special touch. Thank you so much, O oh Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Can we please all rise for victory in Jesus? Again, just one verse. our usual tradition, I guess you could say, in this pandemic. As Ted plays, if you'd like to drop an offering in the offering place, a financial offering, feel free to do so. And again, if you're watching online, you can also donate online on our website. Uh, the donate button's in the top right-hand corner of the screen. It's a big old red, or excuse me, orange button. You can't miss it.
may be seated. Okay, at this time we've got a video called Build a Dad. This is Build a Dad, and he's pretty great. Build a Dad is available in many shapes, sizes, and qualities, and includes a variety pack of accessories. You can build a business dad, or a funny dad, a handy dad, or a where do you think you're going dad. You can build a disappointed dad, or a sad dad, a friendly dad, or a don't make me pull this car over dad. Build a superhero dad. Brainy dad, a proud dad, or a teaching my kid to drive dad. Build a short dad, or a tall dad, a hairy dad, or a going bald dad. Build a tea party dad, or a princess ballerina dad, a my daughter's first date dad, or a time for a lecture dad. Act now and we'll send you the attachable kung fu denture grip. <laughs> now, wait a minute, that's not how it really works. Although, the kung fu denture grip would be kind of cool. Father's Day is a day to thank God for the unique, one-of-a-kind dad he created just for us. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Build a Dad includes two bottles of non-toxic hair tonic for hair follicle encouragement. May not work depending on heredity and life stress. In some cases, hair tonic may not work at all, but God loves you just the way you are. Thanks, Dads. Oh, mercy me. So uh, last Sunday, I had intended to preach on a, uh, a dad type of sermon for Father's Day, but we... Uh, we're able to honor Peyton uh, with a graduation. I figure we ought to do something special as far as sermon goes for that. So let's talk a little bit about Father's Day. Father's Day was last Sunday. Uh, you know, uh, fatherhood is, is a great institution. Uh, I have been blessed to be a father. September 29, 2009, I became a dad. Um, <laughs> after my wife yelled and screamed at me because she was giving uh, birth to our child and, and he wouldn't come out. Um, uh, I became a dad and uh, from ever since then I've, I've just, it's been a, a different ride for me because I grew up without a father in my household. Um, in fact, I, I'm doing better than my dad did. I showed up, right? So I've learned in my life from other males in, in, in life, my, my grandfather, my brother, my uncles, teachers, we even learned from uh, literary figures and pop culture icons about what fatherhood is. And I was thinking, you know, if I could have the ideal dad, who would my dad be? And uh, I've thought of many different characteristics, but the one character in literary works keeps coming up. Now, one of those books I had to read in school, and some people my age have had to read, uh, and it's called uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Some of y'all may have read it, may not have read it. But the dad in that Atticus Finch is just, oh. He'll always be Gregory Peck in my mind from the movie, uh, but wonderful quotes. Let me share two quotes from you. If you can't see them on the screen there, I'll read them to you. One, the quote on the left says, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. That's much akin to that old saying, walk around somebody's shoes, right? Empathy. You know, a great dad should teach their children consideration for others, empathy for others. Uh, walk around their shoes, walk around their skin, right? Another quote here, uh, courage. Courage is not a man with a gun in his hand. It is knowing that you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway. And you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Wow, teaching the kids courage. Fathers should... Uh, exude in, in these certain characteristics to their children, to, to teach their children, the children certain ways of living and being. The fathers should also model certain attributes uh, that which their children should emulate. You know, I could name off all these different great fathers that have been around, and I'm sure you may have had a good father, or grandfather, or father figure in your life. Uh, you can name off literary characters, pop culture figures, but there's even, you could say, God the Father Himself is a great example of what a father should be. But I want to go to a story that we often look at uh, called the prodigal son story in Luke's Gospel and talk about that father there because I think this father shares uh, characteristics and, and attributes of a father that we can learn from, that we can take heart in as, as uh, men of God and even other Christians, female Christians should learn from as well. 
Luke chapter 15, uh, we find the first characteristic this father, the prodigal son story, uh, gives us is he's approachable. I'm going to read a few verses and we'll expound upon this notion of him being approachable. He also said, Jesus speaking here, Jesus tells this parable, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. In other words, Daddy, I want my inheritance now. You know, I, it, it'd be strange to hear a child tell their parent that now, even this day and age. Imagine back in the ancient society, ancient world, where uh, things were very different. It was a very patriarchal society, very much a uh, child was property in, in many ways uh, up until they were uh, adult, grown adults and had made their own way to, in some sense. Going to the dad and said, Dad, give me your money now. It's almost like saying, Dad, I wished you were dead. <laughs> wow. And it uh, goes on to say, Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of the country who had sent him to, into the fields to feed his pigs. A good Jewish boy back in those days wouldn't feed the pigs, right? That was, they were unclean. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating. Hog slop. Can you imagine eating hog slop? But no one would give him any. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food. Here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father. Now what does it mean for a father to be approachable? And I'm learning this myself. My boys could tell you this. Is that despite whatever wrong that child may have done, it's important to still love that child and still welcome that child back. Say, I know you've done wrong. I know, I know you messed up, but I still love you anyway. Approachability. I mean, it's, uh, when, when the hand's caught in the cookie jar, still loving that child and wanting the best for that child. And, I, you know, and that doesn't just end once the child has moved on and become 18 or whatever age and moved out of the household. And no matter what age, we children, and I still go to my mom every now and then, Mama, I need you. Mama, I need your advice. You know, you never uh, really, your child never really is totally raised. And I'm convinced, even as a parent, I'm never totally raised, in, in, but I'm always learning and growing. But you must be approachable. Imagine if, if we couldn't approach God. Imagine if we couldn't come to God in prayer. The shame of our sin hanging over us. I, you know, we, we, we don't want to, we're like Adam and Eve hiding in the Garden of Eden because we figured out we're naked. The sin's hanging over us saying, I don't want to talk to God, can't see God, can't, it's not, I, you've got to get away from God. But no matter what wrong we have done, God still welcomes us back. God still is approachable to us and forgives us if we are willing to be ask for forgiveness. That example, an example we see of this father in this story is, is how we as, as parents, especially we as fathers, should be with our children. To always have a door open. To always have arms ready to welcome them no matter what they've done. No matter how frivolously or sinfully they have lived. Most of y'all have heard of the Christian writer Max Licato. He's, he's written numerous volumes of, of great Christian thought. Um, sold a bunch, a bunch of books. This is a quote from his daughter, Andrea Licato. This was found on the Focus on the Family website. It says, Some adolescent behaviors are inevitable. And I don't believe parents have much control over them. What we do have control over is their response. My parents were careful with how they choose their responses. My sisters and I subconsciously understood this. Our parents are, are approachable. They love us and will forgive us. We'll have to learn from our mistakes. You know, one of the things that I, again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out as a father is, is, is how to... Um, Discipline my children how to um, correct them, but yet show them compassion and love and, and, and let them learn from their own mistakes. 
One of the things I've done recently is watch Jonas practice on the ball field, and, and luckily Dallas is going to, whether, whether luckily or not, Dallas is going to have a baseball season this year, rec ball. And uh, I, I see him out on the ball field swinging and throwing, and I, was, I just want to yell out, buddy, you need to, you know, you spread out your stance a little bit, you know, uh, you know, swing a little, swing up just a little bit. You're swinging down on the ball. You know, I keep on giving him this advice. Like I want to be out there on the field with him doing it for him. And I'm sure every parent at some point in their life has wanted to, to do, it, do things for their child for them, to, to get them through the pain, to get them through the difficulties, to get them through the trials. But every child has to learn, don't they? The prodigal son in this, this, this self-contained story that Jesus tells, he had to learn, didn't he? The dad could have just corrected him at the moment that the child asked for the inheritance. But the dad gave him some space to go out into this land and just live a wild life and to have to learn that he needed his father. He had done wrong. But the dad was there as approachable. And the, and the child knew, the prodigal son knew he could go back to his dad. I love even this Andrea Licato. I'm sure she got a lot of pressure growing up for her dad being so famous, such a such a lofty Christian figure, the type of pressure she got, but she knew that her dad was always approachable. That, she, that children need their space to learn and to grow on their own. But not only should a good, good father be approachable, but we notice in this story that the prodigal son's father was associated with heaven. That somehow, in some way, if this hypothetical story were real, this son had learned about God and learned about the kingdom of heaven from his father. Verses 18 and 19 of Luke chapter 15 says, I'll get up, this is the prodigal son speaking, I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I will no longer, I see I am no longer worthy to be called your son, made me like one of your hired hands. But notice that line. I will go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Not just I've done wrong against you, Dad, but I've sinned against God. It's very important for parents to teach their children and to model their children the ways of God. And it's one of the things that I'm, I'm learning and I'm not perfect at it by any means. And, and, and most of y'all have probably already modeled here in the congregation today, have modeled God to their children. But it's a continual thing, isn't it? Modeling and, and pointing to God throughout the whole journey of life. You see, when this prodigal son thought of his father, he thought about God. Wow, that's powerful. He was trained in the ways that he should go, as the Proverbs reminds us, right? Train a child in the way they should go. No matter what sinfulness, no matter what debauchery, no matter what uh, uh, trials our children get into, if we raise them right, if we have shown them the right ways of God, I have a sneaking suspicion I'll stick with them. And though they may not be as, as pious or as, as Christ-like as we would want, if we give them that good moral compass of right and wrong, the hope is that one day they'll turn to God. And they'll stick with God and be faithful to God. It doesn't always plan, pan out that way. I'll never forget uh, one church I served one time had a, a family the husband and wife, uh, they had uh, three sons. The husband and wife are the, the most godliest people you ever meet. Love them to death. They'd do anything for you. I mean, they, they weren't, they weren't uh, rich by any means. They'd worked in the mills all their life. And they had, you know, they, but they would bend over backwards to do anything for the preacher. In fact, the, uh, <laughs> the wife uh, used to bake me coconut cakes. Best coconut cakes they ever had. Best. But their three sons... You talk about uh, troublemakers, hooked on drugs at times, live wild lives. You know, and I always wondered, you know, what happened? What went wrong? I don't know the answers. That's not, it's not my family. It's not necessarily my business. But I do know this, that they had planted a seed in their son's lives. Another one of their sons rededicated his life before I had left that church. After all the struggles of life, it took him getting down, eating the hog slop to realize that he needed God. That God he had learned about from his parents many moons ago. 
Because he looked at his dad and he associated his dad and his mom with God, with heaven. The grace and the mercy that they modeled pointed him to heaven. But another characteristic we find in this passage about a father I think we should uh, take a note from is that this father was affectionate. Now, there's an old school of thought to saying the father shouldn't necessarily show affection to their children. You know, you get the model of the mother being the loving, doting uh, type, and you get the father who's kind of the stoic, uh, you know, un- 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 emotionally shaken type person. But uh, this father in this story is, is shows affection. Believe it or not, he shows affection for his son that's rather blatant. Verse 20 reads, So he got up and went, this is the prodigal son, got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Didn't care necessarily whether it was uh, socially acceptable or not. This father missed his son, loved his son, and welcomed him back. You know, this old notion of fathers shouldn't show love to their children, I, I think that's not healthy or productive. In fact, I was reading uh, a few articles and different uh, thinkers of, of thought about uh, children, and uh, children need to know they're, they're welcome and secure. And they can, they can know that they're welcomed and secure by, fam- by families, especially fathers, showing them love and affection, hugging their children. Here's five simple ways I saw in this article uh, on, on ways that fathers can show uh, affection to their children. Hug your children every day, if possible. Say, I love you every day. I mean, it's just simple things to remind your children that you care. Simple, I love you. Be creative in how you show your affection. I know my brother, um, he was, you know, my brother's 14 years older than me. Uh, When he was still alive, he used to get me down on the floor and he'd wrestle with me. He didn't have to, but he showed he he spent time with me and would wrestle on the floor with me like like Rick, you know, like Rick Flair and Ricky the Dragon Steam and all these pro wrestlers. He'd wrestle with me just to show me he loved me, spent time with me. He showed affection to me. Another way to show affection to children is never stop. Uh, never, Never forget that children need affection. Just always remember that. Another thing to take note of is that, uh, that affection, is import- affection is important. Here's a quote. For every child, physical affection tells them that they are valued and they accepted for who they are and that their dad will keep them safe and that their dad is proud of them and approves of them and that they are loved no matter what. Don't be like that, that dad I heard one time say, uh, tell the mom and tell the child, says, I told you I loved you one day and if it ever changes, I'll let you know. My mom still tells me she loves me. And I tell my children I love them very much. Do you tell your children you still love them? And most of y'all are here with us, have adult children. And I've met some of y'all's children. But do you tell them you love them? Do you remind them of that? Do you hug them? Um, do you go the extra mile to remind them to, to love their children and their grandchildren? It's important to show affection, to, to show that we care. Sometimes it's as simple as, the, even in the pandemic era, something as simple as a human touch is important. It really is. Another thing uh, this passage shows us about fathers, I think is important for me, especially as a father of two boys, to learn is, is a father, there's a father in this story who assures both his children that he loves them. Both children. He doesn't play favorites. You'll find families every now and then where there's favorites, Right? My sister often accuses my mother of treating me as though I'm the favorite. I'm the baby I was treated much better than my sister was, my sister reminds you. She's not here to defend herself or fight, but, you know, I'm not the favorite. She is. But the passage goes on to say, this is uh, verses 21 through 22, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So this, this prodigal son who had gone off and lived wild and crazy came back and he was treated like a king. He was treated well by his father. Now mind you, there's another son who's been sitting there the whole time. 
He didn't go off and live the wild lifestyle, didn't blow all the money. He was there for his father, being faithful, and he's probably worked every day hard for his father on the farm. We, we assume we don't know. But his response goes on, and he just pitches a fit. Well, Dad, why didn't you do that stuff for me? I was here the whole time. What does the father say to this other son, the jealous son? He says, son, he said to him, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. The father loved both his children very much. You see, playing favorites with your children it can, be, can be very dangerous and detrimental to the development. Uh, and I love my boys both very much, and I love them for different reasons, and they're, both, they're night and day personality-wise sometimes. And I, I don't want to ever try to play favorites because it can damage them. And I think in some ways, even today, my sister and I have a strained relationship because we each other view each other being treated as a favorite in some ways. But I'm reminded that uh, playing the favorites for your children can cause depression in the child who's not his favorite. It can cause greater aggressiveness. It can lower self-esteem. And for those who are in school, it can cause poor academic performance. Even the child who's favored can have ramifications. There can be ramifications for them being treated as a favorite. They could, there could be resentment and poisoning of relationships, bitterness. You know, one of the bad things about being a minister and going and walking alongside families through death and through the, the grief period is seeing how families fuss and fight after a death. But some of the, the nastiest and most bitter, drawn out, protracted uh, grief periods I've ever seen out of families are these families where the, the, the parent has died and the kids are left to try to divide the state and they have such a bitter, acrimonious relationship with each other because one was treated as a favorite and they just fuss and they fight. They don't know how to be brother and sister or brother and brother, what have you. They don't know how to do it because all they've ever done is fuss and fight because mama treated one better than the other. That's not productive whatsoever. It's not good. You know, this story, the prodigal son story, is a story of a son who went off and lived a wild life. It's a story of a father who welcomed him back. It's a story of a father-son relationship. But we know that in the parables of Jesus, it's not really the surface level that is really the, the, what Jesus intends. There's something a little deeper. In many ways, this story is not just a story about a father and how a father should treat a child, but it's a story of how God treats us. How God loves us and cares for us and forgives us. And while we can look all day at this father in this story and try to pick out attributes of a good father or a good father figure or how to be a good parent, Ultimately, when we need to find the best example of how to be a good parent, we look at God Himself. Who above and beyond anything this prodigal son's father did, He loves us and welcomes us. Think of the many times in Israel's life where uh, they were rebellious against God. God still loved them. Of course, God gave them a whooping every now and then. The Babylonian exile was a whooping, discipline, right? God sent the Romans in some ways as a discipline upon them. But God always, lo always loved them and cared for them and provided a way, welcoming them back. Think about all the times in our life where we've been rebellious to God. And our, our, lovingly, uh, our loving Heavenly Father has welcomed us back with open arms, caring for us when we least deserve it. So if I were to ask the question, how should we live as, as a father or as a parent? Just be like God. Be like God. Be approachable, be loving, show affection. Don't play favorites, but always be accessible. I think we have a God who loves us, who welcomes us anytime to talk to Him. We don't have to go to a priest to talk to God. We go directly to God Himself. We don't have to come to church to meet with God. We don't have to be contained behind these stained glass windows to somehow magically meet with God. We can commune with God wherever. We can uh, sit or stand on an overview over Rockfish Gap in Virginia and look at the beautiful mountains and somehow communicate and commune with God saying, God, how mighty and majestic you are. He's approachable. He's, he's loving. He's caring. He's the type of dad I want to be. I know I'm a Sunday late on this Father's Day sermon, but I know that uh, 
And I know many of y'all have grown children who you may have made mistakes in the past. You may have done everything right in the past. But uh, I'd be naive to think that you're not... I would be naive to think that you're done raising your children. Uh, you're done raising your children with, when you go on to glory or they go on to glory. So uh, each and every one of you as a parent or as somebody who is, has parental sway over other individuals, be like God. Be like God. In a moment we're going to sing and the altar is open. If you'd like to pray to speak with me or if you're at home, if you'd like to pray, Reach out to me and I can get back in touch with you later and pray with you later if need to. Thank you. Can we please all rise for I love to tell the story. As we get ready for Fourth of July, we, you know, and uh, you may do something special. You may go somewhere. I know a lot of the big town celebrations are either changed or tweaked in some ways. Dallas is doing something, but it's not what they usually do. I hope you are safe. Hope you have fun. We'll come back together next Sunday, and we'll talk about freedom. We'll talk about sacrifice. Uh, a lot of times, we can't have freedom without sacrifice. Amen. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk about that. Um, but in the interim. I encourage you to wear your mask. I encourage you to social distance. I encourage you to wash your hands. Uh, I saw a meme floating around on Facebook. I, I think I, I, I cackled and, and, and had a bit of a, a gasp too at the same time. It said, uh, if you don't wear your mask now, you ain't going to have a babysitter when fall starts back, when school starts back. So my, my, taxpayer, my taxpayer babysitter, the schools may not be open, right? So y'all, uh, encourage you to wear your mask. I encourage you to be, uh, uh, to uh, be, responsible with how you do things. Um, do mention to you, we did talk last Sunday with some of the deacons, kind of an emergency plan if things got worse, if we had multiple cases of uh, virus in our church, we may, we're not going to go back just to streaming. Uh, the consensus was if we're going to have to do something different, not meet in a sanctuary, we'll try to do maybe a drive-in church and try to stream that too. Uh, I don't, I want to give you all the option if you want to get out and do something to do, okay? to be a church, to see somebody you know, to fellowship. Right? Church, is in, it's important to fellowship. You can do it over Facebook, or you can do it by calling somebody. You can fellowship by sending a letter. But to see that person in person and to talk with them, uh, or to at least wave at them, that's important. So uh, y'all behave and be responsible. If not, we're going to have to have drive-in church. Okay, fair enough? Okay. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house today. This, this building with so much history and so much tradition where many fathers and parents have come through these halls and raised their children. And There's generational legacy here, Lord. We thank you that we're able to come here to worship. Thank you for the tradition and the legacy that our parents have given us, our grandparents, great-grandparents. May we pass it on to the next generation. And may we continually pass it on until we either get in your glory or they enter glory, Lord. May we be parents like you, O oh God, a loving, caring, approachable parent who disciplines but still loves. Thank you so much, O oh Lord. In your name we pray.
Amen.